Well, the book of Luke, and I don't have time to do a, a whole study, but Luke is much about discipleship. And, you know, if you want to in your minds think about this, all the elements of what a perfect disciple looks like in the book of Luke are demonstrated in the book of Acts in the life of Paul. Paul was the perfect disciple of Luke's gospel. Paul was the perfect follower of Christ's call in the book of Luke. Think about that. Remember, Luke and Acts are, are actually companion volumes. Uh, Luke wrote both of them under the inspiration of God's Spirit. Most likely, most scholars believe that Luke and Acts were the court documents that Paul presented to Caesar. And I've told you that before. That's why the Romans are always presented as noble and wonderful. They probably were, but, but Luke especially accents any noble quality of the Romans that he could. The centurions are all good guys. The, everybody are good in the Roman Empire. And, and so uh, in his, his account in Luke and Acts. But what Jesus describes as the perfect disciple is what Paul lives out, the model ideal disciple in the book of Acts. But most of us never could imagine being as good as, as the Apostle Paul. So I'd like to talk to you about a Luke 9.62 individual that almost all of us have heard of because I want you to see the power of that focus of not taking our eyes and our hands off the plow and not ever stopping to look back and to look at Jesus. Do you know how much you can accomplish in your life if you do that? Now, you still go through life. I don't mean that you quit all and, and just, just uh, you know, look unto Jesus. You're still going through life. I mean, I, in the car, I'm still part of the family. I'm still talking and eating and looking to map and listening and everything else. But, but everyone knows what my focus is. And so when I don't fully look them in the eye when I'm driving, it's because I am committed to keeping us in the lane. And that's, that's the overarching call that Christ gives us, that yes, we still have to work and earn a living, and yes, we still have to, you know, rake our yard and and paint our fence or whatever we have to do, but everyone knows that we in our life are headed toward Christ, and we are looking at him, and everything else fits into that track, and that's what commitment is. Well, who is someone who was committed to Christ's calling on his life? Well, he is someone that I think we'll all learn from, and his name was David Livingston. Now, have you ever thought about how focused David Livingston was to a Luke 962 commitment? Let me describe his life. I'll start at the end because he only lived 60 years. The shadow of the 60-year-old David Livingston was silhouetted against the canvas of his tent. He was in the heart of Africa. Next to his cot was a flickering candle that cast a, a glowing, uh, just a glow around that, that lit him inside that tent. He was kneeling beside a small wooden canvas cot. The rhythmic tropical rain was pelting the tent. And as everyone knew, he was praying beside his bed. The prayer was one he had written out many years before and always prayed. This is interesting. David Livingston was a very methodical, disciplined man. He wrote those journals. That's why he's famous. He found Victoria Falls and lots of other things. He actually opened Africa up to the gospel, Central Africa. But he wrote this prayer out. And if you were there by his tent in... Those days of his final year, you would have heard that night what his prayer was, because it would have sounded just like what he wrote. He wrote this as his nightly prayer. O Lord, since thou hast died to give thyself for me, no sacrifice would seem too great for me to make for thee. That was his nightly prayer. Well, outside his native porters, his guides, and his cooks, who had followed him for 20 years through the jungle, heard again the low sound of his voice communing with God, as he always did. They testified every night, the great David Livingston, wherever they set up his tent in the jungles, would always kneel by that cot with his candle by his little cot, and he would get on his knees, and they could see through the tent, they could see the shape of him kneeling by that little cot. And then the candle flickered out as they watched him by that bed, And they also retired to sleep through the rainy night. The difference is on that day in 1873, when the natives came back to prepare breakfast for David Livingston, and they opened the flap of the tent, they found he was still on his knees. And they found his cold and stiff, lifeless body frozen in a kneeling position by his bed. For as he was praying those words... Still kneeling by the cot where his beloved native brothers found him, so thin from the countless bouts of malaria, his skin darkened by the years of equatorial African sun, 
His skin was just loosely draped over the bones of his earthly tent. But the tent was now vacant. For the man who had prayed, Lord, no sacrifice would be too great for you. I'm going to keep my eye on you. I'm going to keep my hand to the plow. The Lord had called him home. His life course was finished. He, now immortal, had made his flight in the night from the darkness of the disease-ridden, weak, and failing body to the realm of light and life. He was now in the presence of Jesus, his king, to whom he had lived a committed life. Well, who was David Livingston? I think he's someone that we all should know because he is such an example of Luke 9.62, of putting his hand to the plow of what Christ called him to do and never looking back. Even when he was sick, even when he was terribly persecuted, even when he was physically endangered, and even when he became famous, which, by the way, he did become very famous, and yet he pushed all that aside and said, I will not look back. David Livingston was born in the Scottish city of Blantyre in 1813, At age 10, his parents pulled him out of school to work 14 hours a day in the cotton mill because they were so impoverished. There he learned and taught himself by snatching one sentence at a time from a book that he would place on top of his weaving jenny. He worked in that cotton mill that was was combing and making the, the fabric. And so he would set his book up on top of that spinning jenny and would grab one sentence and then keep doing his work and grab another sentence. And he did that until he was 20 years old and educated himself, working 14 hours a day. There, with his spinning reading, followed by two hours of night school, that discipline kept him from being totally uneducated. Two years later, he was converted at age 12 and had a profound spiritual awakening at age 20. Leaving the mills, he resolved to be a medical missionary in China because a pastor had come through his church and talked about the the unreached people of China, in 1825, and he wanted to go. And so he went off to the nearest city, Glasgow, and studied Greek and theology and medicine, working at the mill during vacation times to pay his expenses. He became qualified in medicine, was sent by the London Missionary Society in 1840 to South Africa because China was closed at the time. There in South Africa, he was stirred by another missionary's words that in the center of Africa there was the smoke of a thousand villages that that missionary had seen in the distance. A thousand villages that had never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. David Livingston could never get that from his mind. Livingston and his wife Mary stayed in three homes for three years as they moved up country towards Central Africa. He was an evangelist, a doctor, a teacher, a builder, a gardener, a shoemaker, and a carpenter. But all the time his eyes were on the unknown north behind the fearsome Kalahari Desert where he was going to reach those unreached people. In 1852, Livingston sent his wife and children back to England as he was finally decided to embark on a four-year-long, 6,000-mile journey that would take him from Angola on the Atlantic coast of Africa all the way across to the Indian Ocean at Mozambique. During those long, wearying years, David Livingston was debilitated by illnesses, constantly in danger of wild animals, constantly being hunted by hostile tribes. But all through this time, he never relaxed his self-imposed discipline. And we know he's famous for that. His drawings, his diaries, his discoveries, his explorations. But in 1853, his first year of travel, this is what he wrote in his journal. He says, I place no value on anything I have except how it relates to the kingdom of Christ. Now that is someone whose hands are on the steering wheel and whose eyes are on the road. He knew what he was living for. When Livingstone's wife died in 1861, he threw himself fiercely into his work. He disappeared from sight for the next 10 years. He was finally found by Henry Morton Stanley of the New York Herald in 1871. That's the Dr. Livingston, I presume, story most of us have heard of. After two days of Stanley's pleading, Livingston said, no, I will not go back at any cost. I will not go back. They said, England wants you. You're famous and and everything. He said, I will not go back. And this is what he wrote in his journal. March 19th, 1871, my birthday. 
My Jesus, my King, my life, my all, I again dedicate my whole self to thee. Accept me and grant me, O gracious Father, that ere the year is gone, I may finish my work. In Jesus' name, I ask it. Amen. And you know, it was less than a year and a half later that his, his porters and native guides found him on his knees and dead by his cot. David Livingston, the renowned no, uh, and noble missionary of Africa, wrote in his journal that people talk of the sacrifice he made and giving his life to the African people. But he said, how can that be called sacrifice, which is simply paying back a small part of the great debt I owe to God, which I can never repay? Away with such a view. Rather say that sacrifice is a privilege. Anxiety and sickness and suffering or danger now or then is but a gift as I give myself back. All these things are nothing when compared to the glory which I will hereafter be revealed in and for me. I never made a sacrifice. Of this we ought not to talk, of, but rather talk of him who made the great sacrifice, leaving his father's throne to give himself for us. At his death by that cot in 1873, such was the love for him. The native assistants actually wrapped his body tightly in the native fashion for mummification, and they carried his body 1,500 miles to the coast, flagged down a British steamer, and put his body to be taken back to London. That was how much they loved him. In fact, one of his native porters stood at the, among the huge crowd at Westminster Abbey, and the words on his tombstone summarize his life. For 30 years, his life was spent in unwearied efforts to evangelize the native races and to explore the undiscovered secrets. Now, why did I share all that? Because David Livingston is but one known example of Luke 9.62. He had everything going against him. Ten years old, jerked from school, living in an impoverished family, having to work 14 hours a day having no earthly comforts, but wanting to know the Bible and the languages of the Bible and a skill so he could share the Bible and having a heart in flame to reach Christ well done by doing what God called him to do. With that background, listen to the rest of his prayer. I want to take you back to the tent where he is dimly seen through the, the candlelit light silhouetted against the canvas of the tent, because I didn't read to you his whole prayer that he prayed every night. His prayer is a prayer of commitment that I think all of us should think of. This is what he actually said. O Lord, since you have died to give yourself for me, no sacrifice would seem too great for me to make for thee. Lord, send me anywhere. Only go with me. Lay any burden on me. Only sustain me. Sever any tie, save the tie that binds me to thy heart. Lord Jesus, my King, I consecrate my life to thee. I only have one life, and that will soon be passed. I want my life to count for Christ. What's done for him will last. I follow thee, my Lord. I glory in your cross. I gladly leave the world behind, and I'll count all gain as loss. Lord, send me anywhere. Only go with me. Lay any burden on me, only sustain me. Sever any tie, save the tie that binds me to thy heart. Lord Jesus, my King, I consecrate my life, Lord, to thee. That is laying hold on commitment.